السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته که تو ترانی ماریه May the peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon you. Welcome to another live session of We Are One, an interactive program um, where we try and highlight some of the different aspects um, of faith, of religion, and especially focusing on the universal aspects and those things which unite us. And we've mentioned this many times before that one concept which is universal is the humanity that we have and people of faith we have that belief in one God in one Creator and essentially that that one God one Creator has created everyone and Logically, rationally, if that one God, one Creator has placed all these things in the heavens and in the earth for the benefit of humanity, and that's in one way an expression of the love of God, then firstly, if we love God, then we must love God's creation. And these are two fundamental aspects of faith. The relationship you have with God and the relationship and the rights of God's creation. If you love the artist, you must love his work. If you love the creator, you must love his creation. And that should be across the board, irrespective of the religion, nationality, color of an individual. And these are logical views on life and rational views on life and for people of faith that should be a uniting factor now as is normally custom we will begin the program with a recitation from the holy book of islam from the holy quran and this is in the arabic language and this is a chapter called Surah al khashiya and it's uh, the 88th chapter of the Holy Quran. So we'll have a listen to that before we go on to today's discussion. هل أتاك حديث الغاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاضية فيها عين جارية فيها سرر مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم 
So there we just heard a recitation of a chapter of the Holy Quran, the 88th chapter, um, and the last few verses also remind um, that فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ That to remind people. Um, and reminder is what is important. And constantly, we, throughout our lives, I think we always need reminders um, for keeping us on the right track. And those kinds of reminders are essential for us. And talking about reminders, we, as human beings, I think we always have some kind of role models in our lives. And having a role model helps to keep one on track. And today I'm joined by um, my co-host brother Tashriq, um, who, as I mentioned before as well, is also the producer, director of the program as well. Um, and brother Tashriq, I was just talking about co uh, 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 sorry, role models and Normally, you know, as human beings, it's human nature from from childhood that we have some kind of role models in our lives. Sometimes we're growing up, um, that could be, you know, um, for, for some people, it may be one of their parents or their father or, um, you know, a sports star or a anyone else. Growing up, we, we, or um, even now, like, we, who, what's your role model been? What's your aspirations do you set yourselves targets even in your workplace and stuff do you have some kind of you know wider role model out there or uh, what, what's your outlook on that uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakallah uh, brother mustansa uh, it's a great question actually uh, because if i look at life in general and the program we run today firstly when you highlighted the word getting closeness to god and making you know friends with god so if I look at my childhood growing up, I think I would see my mother being the role model for me to push us to where we are today. Yes, not really, you know, taking my dad out of the picture. He's a very nice and humble man too. He, he was there um, supporting us as child, you know, trying to, you know, raise a family. So he's, he was quite committed in that aspect. But I, where we are in terms of our discipline um, gaining nearness and attaining God Almighty's pleasure is the word if I could use here. I think my mom has been the forefront for us. Then I look at my work and uh, my family here living in Carton. I have a massive support at home from my wife, Nusrat. She's one of our role models in our home for my kids. I mean, in terms of, you know, spiritual learning, yes, my wife is quite ahead in that aspect. But when it comes to secular sporting activity, I think my kids look up to me. I'm quite involved in that. We love our football. We love our cricket. We, uh, you know, we love any form of good sport um, that's out there to be supported. And then work, I mean, you know, there's a lot of big inspiration leaders out there. And one particular individual really stands out for me. And I think most people probably know him. It's, it's uh, Richard Branson. I, I like his attitude. Uh, he's the, um, I think, co-founder of Virgin Atlantic. Yes. So that's, those are my three inspirational people in my life that keeps me going, Mustansa. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I, I guess everyone has um, different people they look up to, aspirations. I mean, like... Um, and sometimes for specific things as well, like like you just mentioned for um, work related things, you look up to um, Richard Branson as an inspiration. Um, like uh, I'm sure maybe um, your son growing up be because of interest in football and stuff, he may have um, some specific f football players. Like I, I think you guys support Liverpool. Yes. <laughs> um, so maybe like Mo Salah or even like you know um, great players like Messi or Ronaldo. Yeah. A lot of kids look up to them depending on their um, sports and their interests and stuff. And for specific things, you have specific role models or people you aspire to adopt those certain qualities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but one thing that um, sometimes I, I, I think about is that, like for example, I, I really enjoy football, I play football regularly as well, um, and w when I, I watch football, watch highlights and stuff, I enjoy watching Lin, uh, Lionel Messi. 
and just because of the style of play and the, the involvement, um, how he gets the team involved and stuff as well. But I try and adopt those qualities from watching him play, and he's in, in a way a role model in that limited sense. But I wouldn't take him as a role model for life in general. Right. In every aspect of life, my moral qualities, I wouldn't um, look at all these things because sometimes big sports stars and stuff, um, they are really good at their craft, right? at their sport, at their, um, uh, what they're doing. Right? But in other aspects, they may not be an example. Yes. Right? And in, in that sense, I think role models or, uh, com uh, are sometimes limited or they should be limited. We should also try, and I mean, f sometimes you have to have multiple role models, like, you know, role model in sports, role model in your workplace, a role model in your daily life, like, you know, um, uh, your, your house life, your spiritual life, and all these things as well. But I think one thing that w people of faith have is a role model, which is a role model in everything. And... That is usually the founder of their faith, the founder of their religion. Christians have that in, um, you know, Jesus, may peace be upon him, who's a role model. Um, and Jews have that, um, Hindus have that, and Muslims have that in the Prophet of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Salusa. may peace be upon him. And he's a perfect role model. The Quran describes him as a Uswa Hasana, the, um, um, a perfect role model for us. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, oh, you know, uh, that I shouldn't look to Lionel Messi to be a role model in the field of sports. It means that all the principles of life, I can learn from the example of the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. So the moral aspects, how I should conduct myself, how I should talk with others, how I should behave in front of others, how I should treat my neighbours, how I should treat the wider society, the, uh, what my responsibilities are towards each other, to animal kingdom, to the plant kingdom, um, to, to God Almighty, um, and how in times of adversity and difficulty, um, how I should act. Um, the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, faced the most severe persecution. There were times when he was literally, um, a rope would be tied around his neck and he'd be dragged across the streets until someone had to come and um, rescue him. He was pelted with stones and profusely be bleeding. And um, it, all these times, he never retaliated. At times of adversity, he was an example for Muslims. But then he also had other aspects in his life where he was at the peak of his power. Right? where he could have taken revenge for the person who was responsible for the death of his own daughter and killed him. But, and all those people who had persecuted him for a long period of time and the early Muslims as well. But what was his example there? It was that, no, don't take revenge, show forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And then when he marched back upon um, uh, Mecca, his hometown from where he had been driven out, and he marched back to, upon there, to the same people who had persecuted them for such a long period of time and waged wars on, the, on them and killed many of the Muslims. He went back and declared complete amnesty. He forgave everyone. And he set an example for us. Yes. That, you know, these are the moral qualities that you should have. Times of adversity, show patience. Turn towards God. At times of power, when you have the power to take revenge, still show forgiveness. Show mercy. Because if you do that, then God Almighty will show you mercy and forgiveness as well. Yeah. No, very, very nicely put through, Mustansa, because when those moral qualities, you know, people adapt and look up to somebody like you have alluded to, our Holy Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. Um, if we lead that simple life, you have, you know, people around you watching those qualities. You have your kids watching you on a day-to-day -day basis. So, it sticks with them so when they grow up they start adapting the same qualities i totally agree with you and if i can take an example of uh, your neighbors uh, you know 
maintain peace around your neighborhood you know don't cause any inconvenience for them i'm mean, these are some simple basic thing uh, talking about house chores how the Pro- holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know spent time in the kitchen helping his wives i mean those are very simple basic household chores he used to do fixing his own shirt you know mending his own shoes i mean in this day and age we tend to you know sometimes we are a bit lazy and we 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 oversee all these things but if we start to them think those simple moral qualities it just leads us to be a better human being mm, exactly and 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 that what you were just mentioning the emphasis on simplicity yes right and just living a simple um life not getting too embroiled in um and chasing chasing things which you know you know once you begin to acquire them that desire never runs out like for example that um Uh, that desire for material wealth the more you get the more you want yes and ne- that that you you're never able to quench yourself it's it's such a drink that you take partake of it you just constantly want more and more and more right and you're never satisfied but um that that simplicity in that model that example of the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him as well where he when, when he lived a poor life um, or even when he was offered all the wealth in the world he still gave that away he would still give that in charity because that's where true contentment true peace is found mm-hmm. he lived a very simple life and taking care of you know the needs of others and stuff and the, the, that that point that you just mentioned about um i mean we have the example of the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him but sometimes we need living examples as well right um we, we can read about those examples we can learn about those examples that's a perfect example for us um and that's why we learn about the life of the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him as well but growing up we also need living examples and sometimes that's in our parents right um if if our parents are good role models for us then our upbringing will most likely be a lot better as well because if our parents are you know showing good morals when they're out and about they're always honest they're not de- 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 um, living a life of deception with others and stuff they're not two-faced they're not uh, one way at home and another way outside um and you know you, they're, they're very genuine and stuff then the, most likely the children will turn out the same as well but if the ch- if the parents are you know embroiled in immorality they're drinking taking drugs and you know fighting at home and stuff as well and always swearing at each other and stuff the kids are going to grow up in that environment and they're going to adopt those qualities Yep. It, and that has an impact on them and that's why you look for role models in, in you know whether that be at home or outside you find role models and that's natural in, as as human beings which leads me to a living role model our community has today which is the caliph of the time and caliphate is a system which also helps to provide a living role model for us we believe the caliph or the khalifa to be divinely appointed and caliphate is a system which is a spiritual system where the khalifa or the caliph of the time is divinely appointed by god almighty as and reminds you of your responsibilities to god and towards god's creation and not only just reminding you but being an example of how to act upon that and we've seen and heard um, previously as well some of the different aspects um, of the current caliph as his holiness hazrat mirza masur ahmed may um, allah strength in his hand he has driven a lot of humanitarian projects as well and under his guidance we've got humanity first which does a lot of um, you know humanitarian projects but also reminding countries nations of their responsibilities to each, towards each other to absolute justice to um, help prevent wars and also reminding us of our obligations towards god and i wanted to bring us back today a bit to the prophecy of the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him where the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him had foretold caliphate in these latter days and that's why you have these different muslim so called muslim organizations which are trying to establish caliphate and they've been trying for many many years and many um the, the past centuries replete and full of examples um, we, we even many people have heard of isis and how they have tried to establish a caliphate um and uh, an so called islamic state and obviously their understanding is wrong and that's why they don't have that divine support but our system of khilafat 
has now been going for almost what since 1908 so that's almost uh, 114 years I think um, so it's a divinely appointed system and under that the community is flourishing uh, we're bringing about betterment in ourselves we're helping to bring about betterment in society nations are being reminded of their responsibilities of absolute justice people are being reminded of their responsibilities towards God and it's helping to bring about uh, environment and, and establishing peace it doesn't mean that you know you have to be an Ahmadi but everyone can ben is and benefits from caliphate and some of the examples we've given in the previous programs but the Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him foretold the re-establishment of caliphate and here I'd like to read a prophecy the Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him said that prophethood shall remain among you as long as Allah shall will. So that he was talking about his prophethood. He will bring about its end and follow it with khilafat on the precepts of prophethood for as long as he shall will and then bring about its end. So after the Prophet Muhammad we had um, the uh, khilafat i Rashida which was the four rightly guided caliphs after him. Then he said a tyrannical monarchy will then follow and will remain as um, long as Allah shall will and then come to an end. So after that period of caliphate, there'd be a tyrannical monarchy. And he didn't describe it as caliphate. He called it a monarchy. And even though the term khilafat was used um, uh, at that time, the Prophet Muhammad didn't describe it as true caliphate. And then he said, they will follow thereafter monarchical despotism, to last as long as Allah shall will and come to an end upon his decree. So another phase of monarchy, but it will be a monarchical despotism. And he didn't describe this as caliphate either. Then he said that there will then emerge khilafat on the precept of prophethood. Then he said no more. On the precept of prophethood means that when that Messiah, that reformer, will come in the latter days who will be granted that status of a subservient prophet after him caliphate will be re-established. So just to talk about this prophecy in a bit more detail, I thought I'd um, today share um, a, a documentary I'd made um, about the re-establishment of caliphate and this prophecy in particular and this documentary um, starts with the words of the prophecy in Arabic um, and for those who may be watching on White Harappa TV or on social media they'll be able to also see um, the visuals of this documentary so hopefully this will shed a bit more light into the truth of this prophecy and how it was to be f um, fulfilled <laughs> قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تكون النبوة فيكم ما شاء الله أن تكون ثم يرفعها إذا شاء أن يرفعها ثم تكون خلافة على منهاج النبوة فتكون ما شاء الله أن تكون ثم يرفعها إذا شاء الله أن يرفعها ثم تكون ملكا عاضا فيكون ما شاء الله أن يكون ثم يرفعها إذا شاء أن يرفعها ثم تكون ملكا جبرية فتكون ما شاء الله أن تكون ثم يرفعها إذا شاء أن يرفعها ثم تكون خلافة على منهج النبوة ثم سكت تذكر يا أخي These are the prophetic words of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 1400 years ago, foretelling four distinct periods of Khilafat in the Muslim Ummah. Khilafat on the precepts of prophethood, tyrannical monarchy, monarchical despotism, Khilafat again on the precepts of prophethood. A brief glimpse 
through the annals of history reveals that this prophecy was and is being fulfilled to the letter. In Surah An-Nur, Allah the Almighty has promised the believers who do good works that He will establish for them the institution of Khilafat. In accordance with this divine promise, the first stage of Khilafat which followed the prophethood of the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which was also known as the rightly guided Khilafat was the Khilafat of Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Uthman and Hazrat Ali anhum. And this Khilafat remained from the years 632 to 661 of the Common Era. And this was in exact accord with another prophecy which stated that Khilafat would remain for 30 years. Following this blessed period of Khilafat, the Prophet had prophesied another distinct period of Khilafat, which he referred to as Mulkan Adan. In Arabic, Al Adu refers to holding something between the teeth, cutting or biting. Therefore, this refers to such a monarchy where the claimants to Khilafat will cut at each other's throats. This period extends from 661 to 1516 of the Common Era. It was commonly understood that there should be only one supreme leader of the Muslim Ummah. And it was said, al aimmatu min Quraysh, that the Imam or leader should be from the Quraysh tribe. Therefore, this 855-year period of successorship was inevitably full of leaders from the Quraysh. In other words, Banu Umayyah, Banu Abbas and Bani Fatima. It is said that Banu Umayyah, who ruled from 661 for the establishment of the Khilafat, used such tyrannical means and mercilessly killed on a large scale. This can be seen in the well-known incident of the martyrdom of Imam Hussain the grandson of the Holy Prophet and some 70 members of his family at Karbala by Yazid. So here um, I'll also explain and uh, tell what's being said in the um, Urdu language. Um, so he mentions that um, the shahada um, or the martyrdom of Hazrat Ali was in the 40th year after um, Hijra. Thereafter, the reign of Amir um, Muawiyah commenced. Amir Muawiyah ki iktadar ka aghaz hua. Hazrat Imam Hassan, Imam Hassan withdrew from leadership of the Muslim community with the condition that the Muslims would elect whosoever they desire to be their Imam by consensus. However, this condition was not followed. The terrible incident of Karbala took place in which Hazrat Imam Hussain was martyred in the 61st year after the migration after Hijrah. Thus, as the Holy Prophet um, had prophesied that a dividing monarchy would take place, this incident split the Muslim community into two fractions, the Shias and the Sunnis. Subsequently, during this period of Banu Umayyah, there were the Mezrite and the Yemenite Arab factions. Whose constant quarrels were a cause of further division and the role it played was that of monarchy. As a result, during the time of Banu Umayyah, there were only three leaders who would come to lead the Friday press. Uh, namely Amir Muawiya, um, Abdul Malik bin Marwan and Hazrat Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Although the principles of Islam were never challenged, but the spirit behind these principles was certainly compromised. One incident which took place in the, this dynasty was that they never encouraged people to accept Islam. 
جو ہیں اسلام قبول کریں کیونکہ جزیے میں بیکاز دیٹ کوز ڈراپ ان دا جزیا کانسٹنٹلی لیڈنگ ٹو الو ریونیو اینڈ دس واز وائی دے ووڈ ڈسکریج پیپل ٹو ایکسیپٹ اسلام دے اپروچ واز اف ایکسکلوژن ناٹ انکلوژن دس واز سم تھنگ وچ حضرت عمر بن عبد العزیز ابولیشڈ ود ہز رین اینڈ دس مینی پیپل اینٹرڈ دا فولڈ اف اسلام ان دس ٹائم اور Spain se leke, Many people were included in this from Spain all the way to Sp- um, and at this unprecedented scale, size and strength this monarchy remained. Banu Umayyah's rule remained from 661 to 749. However, as this period of Khilafat was to be a period where claimants to Khilafat would cut at each other's throats, The Khilafat of Banu Umayya was brought to an end by Banu Abbas in 749. Banu Abbas would also mercilessly kill and slaughter any adversaries to the claim of Khilafat, therefore fulfilling the meaning of this time period of Khilafat, where the claimants would cut at each other's throat. When Abdullah bin Ali entered Damascus, He ordered the killing of the people. For Banu Abbas, after the murder of the last Umwi Khalifa Marwan bin Muhammad in Busayra, the wiping out of Banu Umayyah was of the essence. Abdullah bin Abbas killed a group of Banu Umayyah in Basra and left the bodies en route and prohibited their burial. Dogs fed on these carcasses for months. Another Abbasi, Daud bin Ali, picked out every Umayyad in Mecca, Medina, Hijaz and Yemen and killed them all, leaving none behind. This time period was clearly one of the claimants to Khilafat cutting at each other's necks. When Abbas gained power, not only did they seek retaliation from the living, but also from the dead. They would dig up the corpses of the dead and would satisfy their desire for revenge. In, this, in his first sermon, Abul Abbas mentioned that Khilafat, which had now returned to their family, would remain until the descent of Hazrat Isa or Jesus. However, we see that in the reign of these dynasties, many pious and knowledgeable people, like Imam Abu Hanifa, had to bear hardships like imprisonment. Also, Imam Malik and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal were flogged. Once, as they offered prayer, someone stated that this was no salat as they were terribly injured. So all these things commenced but the principles of Islam were never challenged. And the pious souls continued to perform their works. Banu Abbas ruled over Baghdad from 749 to 1258 and then in Egypt from 1261 to 1516. Another factor which came between them was that they excluded the Arabs and after um, Al-Mutasim Billah. The Turks were given more attention causing their leader to be forgotten, thus becoming insignificant. Gradually this monarchy became weaker and later in 1517 when Sultan Salim um, the first attacked Egypt. The final Abbasid Caliph was defeated. Thereafter the monarchy came under the reign of the Ottoman dynasty. The third period of Khilafat has been referred to by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as Mulkan Jabriyah meaning rebellious strong and despotic monarchy this was fulfilled in the Osmani Turkish monarchy this was a strong despotic monarchy which gained power over Egypt and established Islamic monarchy in a non-Arab and non-Qurayshi people 
Sultan Selim Khan Osmani gained victory over Persia, Egypt and Iraq. And he also gained victory over Arabia, creating a despotic Osmani monarchy by wiping out the Abbasi Khilafat in Egypt in 1516. It is from the Abbasi Khilafat that the title of Khalifa was transferred to the Osmani monarchy. As a result of the Mongolian disorder, many Muslims had to migrate, including a particular Osmani family. When Seljuk Sultan appointed the Osmani family in Anatolia, they set up their small sultanate in this small area in 1299. When Sultan Selim attacked Egypt in 1517, he grasped hold, hold of the assets of the family. Which were affiliated with their caliphate from Abbasi, who was the spiritual head at the time, and in this manner he. However, he gained the title of Khadim of Halmain Sharif, the protector of the noble sanctuaries, and this was how he was referred to. Therefore, three big sultanates came into being, the Ottomans established in Turkey, the Safwis in Iran and the Mughal dynasty in India. These were the three main dynasties, but there was no centralized thing. The Safwis, because they were Shias, did not accept the claim of the Ottomans, as there was the case with the Mughals there. Thus, the three dynasties commenced among the Muslims. Hence. This third stage of despotic monarchy began in 1516 and remained until the abrogation of Khilafat in 1924. The the Ottoman leaders were um, politically exploited, exploiting the situation just as the uh, Christian world was encroaching their territory. Territory in the name of the Pope and thus they counter-attacked the Muslims. As a result they were included in the clash and the First World War took place which saw their defeat. Then under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Pasha, Ataturk, a fresh start took place and in 1922 he overthrew the Ottoman leader. In 1924 he finally finished the whole institution of caliphate. The name which was ascribed to them was forever taken away from them. The fourth and final stage of Khilafat, which was to remain until the Day of Judgment, according to this hadith, was Khilafat ala min hajin nabuwa, or Khilafat on the precepts of prophethood. When the time for this Khilafat came and began in 1908, after the demise of the promised Messiah salam, the Osmani Khilafat of Turkey began to weaken and slowly dissolve. In the year the Promised Messiah alayhi salam, laid the foundations of the Jamaat in 1889, the progressive university students established an association by the name of the Young Turks. Due to their demands, the Khilafat began to weaken and lose its power. The demands strengthened and on the 13th of May 1908 in Turkey, the Committee of Union and Progress gave a notice to the Sultan which threatened the end of his power. Hence, on the 24th of July 1908, the titles of Khalifa and Sultan were separated. Khilafat weakened and after the First World War, after the Osmani Khilafat had lost most of its power, Ataturk Mustafa Kemal announced the end of the Osmani Khilafat on the 3rd of March 1924. It is interesting to note that the Promised Messiah alayhi salam, also foretold of this gradual end to the Turkish Empire when he was visited by an ambassador from Turkey 
by the name of Hussein Kami. On the 27th of May 1908, Khilafat on the precepts of prophethood was once again established and it is through this Khilafat that the true teachings of Islam and the Holy Prophet وسلم, are once again to be revived and disseminated in the world. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illahu wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah it is this khilafat that will god willing remain forever so there we just heard and saw a um, short documentary um, about the reality of khilafat or caliphate and its re-establishment how historically the different phases of the prophecy mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, were fulfilled in um, a tyrannical monarchy um, after the Caliphate and monarchical despotism. And the details of that historically and how many you, you will, will have heard as well that the, that period in between which the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, didn't describe as true Caliphate was a time of tyranny, a time where People had lost the true teachings and practices of Islam. And then in these latter days, Khilafat or Caliphate on the precepts of prophethood was to be established again. And whereas the efforts of the other Muslim nations and the, even the Turkish Caliphate was ended, on the other end, the true Caliphate the caliphate following the promised Messiah in Imam Mahdi was truly established and um, in 1908 the Ahmadiyya Muslim community we believe that that divinely established caliphate was established by God and is still there peacefully spreading, teaching the message of Islam to Muslims and reminding people of their responsibility towards God Almighty and the true and beautiful, pristine and peaceful teachings of Islam. And this is exactly um, where our caliphate fits into the larger picture in terms of the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him as well. So I hope that documentary um, also shed some light um, on the actual prophecy and its fulfillment. Now, I've mentioned many times that um, we believe in the founder of our community to be the promised messiah the promised reformer of these latter days and, um, just the other day i was having a discussion um, with the other abrahamic religions Christ uh, christians and um, christianity and judaism and we were talking um, and i've spoken many times um, to others about um, the these kinds of different prophecies in their fulfillment. And we believe that the prophecies regarding the promised Messiah, the second coming of Jesus, um, the second coming of some kind of reformer in these latter days is not to be a separate individual for Christians, a separate one for Jews, a separate one for Muslims, a separate one for Hindus um, and Zoroastrians and Buddhists. But it's supposed to be one individual to unite the whole of mankind. Because remember, we are truly one. We are one people. And before, throughout history, where there was those limitations of transport, of communication, and nations were limited to their own selves, now in this day and age, we don't have those limitations. All of you are sitting in your own homes or in your own cars listening to my voice. I'm able to reach you despite the distances between us. 
just merely picking up my phone. I'm able to reach literally the other side of the world in a matter of seconds. So those limitations of communication, of transport, are no longer there. We've become a global village. Physically, through the communication that we've developed, the transport that has been developed, we've shown that we are one people. And likewise, in these latter days, God Almighty intended that religions would no longer remain national. God Almighty intended to unite everyone under one banner, one teaching, a universal teaching. And we believe that that was to be fulfilled through the coming of the promised Messiah, the promised Mahdi, the second coming of Krishna, the second coming of Buddha, um, or that guru who would come as a Sikh, or whatever title was given in different world religions of the coming of a second uh, or the sec uh, a great reformer in these latter days. They were titles, but all of one individual. And we believe that that individual was the founder of our community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian. And that's where we emphasize that and we try and emphasize that aspect of universality, of we are one, and invite people to understand their responsibilities towards God and understand their responsibilities towards God's creation. So now we will listen to a um, poem um, as we are uh, coming to the close of um, the program. And this poem is in the Urdu language um, and it's about um, Khilafat. And it's to show the dedication that some of our members have towards the worldwide leader of our community, the Caliph. So um, you can listen to it in the Urdu language um, and it's um, sung um, so uh, I hope you enjoy this as well Khalifa ke hum hai Khalifa humara Wo dil hai humara Aka humara Khalifa ke hum hai Khalifa humara वो दिल है हमारा आका हमारा जो तलहा ने हाथों पे तीरों को खाया फिदा हो के आका पे सब कुछ लुटाया जो तलहा ने हाथों पे तीरों को खाया फिदा हो के आका पे सब कुछ लुटाया उसी की तरह हम भी उफना करेंगे अलम दीने आहमत का गिरने न देंगे के जिंदा जमात का ये इस्तेहारा Khalifa ke hum hai, Khalifa hamara, wo dil hai hamara, aaka hamara. Mohabbat ke naare labon pe saja kar, dilon mein masihai sham mein jala kar. محبت کے نعرے لبوں پہ سجا کر دلوں میں مسیحائی شم میں جلا کر زمین کے کناروں کو روشن کریں گے وفاؤں پہ زندہ رہیں گے مریں گے کریں گے زمانے میں اونچا منارا خلیفہ کے ہم ہیں خلیفہ ہمارا وہ دل ہے ہمارا آقا ہمارا جو اہد وفا ہے نبھائیں گے آقا تیرے حکم پہ جان لٹائیں گے آقا 
جو اہد وفا ہے نبھائیں گے آقا تیرے حکم پہ جا لٹائیں گے آقا نہ ہم قوم موسا کی طرح کہیں گے کہ ہم نور دین محمد بنیں گے ہمیں از محمد عطا ہو خدا آیا خلیفہ کے ہم ہے خلیفہ ہمارا وہ دل ہے ہمارا آقا ہمارا جو کابل میں لکھی گئی تھی کہانی مسیح کی صداقت کی زندہ نشانی ہم اپنی وفا پہ نہ حرفان دیں گے تمہیں دل دیا ہے تمہیں جا بھی دیں گے حضور آپ کر کے دیکھیں اشارہ حضور آپ کر کے دیکھیں اشارہ خلیفہ کے ہم ہیں خلیفہ ہمارا وہ دل ہے ہمارا آقا ہمارا 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 خلیفہ ہمارا وہ دل ہے ہمارا آقا ہمارا وہ دل ہے ہمارا آقا ہمارا خلافت کے ہم Brother Tashrik, we were just speaking to um, the head of humanity first um, over here and we're, we're going to try and bring him in um, and we're going to try this for the first time through um, Google Meet. Hopefully we can get a video connection with him as well. So in the meanwhile, while I just quickly um, set up, would you mind just um, uh, maybe just sharing some of um, the updates and... Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Mustansa. Uh, while he tries to get uh, Yunus Hanif on the uh, uh, video call, I just wanted to quickly give an update around the humanity first, what's been happening around the community, uh, etc. Um, by the grace of God, we are progressing really well. The members are increasing in the community. We will be welcoming another family of three to masterton hopefully next tuesday and i must again thank big efforts from the mayor of uh, wararapa masterton should i say red cross in particular uh, tracy um, we've got the um, council sandy uh, there's a big thank you to most of them for making this possible for us from my experience i can definitely say the members are settling in very nicely they're adapting the way of the new zealand lifestyle and hopefully they will be start making contribution to the wider community in the near future so with that that's a brief update from me hopefully in the next two minutes mustansar will try and get the call ready for Yunus. but uh, just to highlight again we will continue this program as, as we build the program, as we get better at it. We would like to encourage our listeners, our viewers, to please do call us. Give us the opportunity to answer any burning question that you might have there for us regarding Islam, Ahmadiyyat, God. If you don't believe in God, anything that's pressing, we are going through some tough economic condition at the moment the budgets we released yesterday any views around that how we can you know answer some of the questions for you you have our item number there you are more than welcome to pose send us an email prior if you need um, if you are willing to um, come on live on air if you would like to even do a video call we'll set up that arrangement for you we'd love some feedback we'd love to hear um, and bringing people um, to our program okay so um, whilst we're waiting for um, brother Eunice to join um, I've 
sent him a um, link to join. Hopefully we're just going to try this out for the first time because this will open up many doors, I think, and opportunities for us. Um, because if, if this works successfully, um, this trial of bringing someone in online, um, then we can have so many different guests and um, others join us on the program from around the world. Um, so let's see if this works. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, I'm not sure if we can hear Brother Yunus. Um, let me see if we can work this out. So, um, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Okay. The um, brother Tashi, can you hear him? No, I can't. Okay, can you, uh, brother Yunus, are you able to speak a bit louder again? No. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, it's yep, perfect. Yeah, it's yes, in. okay. So we're just um, winding up today's um, live radio program, um, and we thought we'd for the first time we'd also trial um, having uh, someone join us online, um, and we had mentioned some of the. Um, things that are done by Humanity First. So we're really putting putting you on the spot um, over here because uh, obviously no, this was not, not pre-planned. But if um, specifically just uh, if you could talk about Humanity First for just a couple of minutes about um, the international organization of Humanity First and the New Zealand um, branch of Humanity First and what we actually um, do uh, with Humanity First. Sure. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you for the invitation. So, uh, briefly, Humanity First is a registered charitable organization that was established some 25 years ago, um, largely uh, after the Balkan Wars um, to cater for refugees that were coming out from that war in, in Europe. So, uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim uh, community and the leader at the time uh, uh, requested that a separate organization be formed to uh, cater for those refugees. So that was the start of the organization. However, since then, and it's been just over 25 years now that the organization has been in place and it's now spread across uh, various countries across the world, uh, doing various charitable works. Um, and in particular, it focuses on several sort of key aspects of um, uh, relating to disaster recovery, um, looking at uh, f um, uh, providing uh, food relief uh, in terms of uh, where there's poverty, uh, but also uh, areas of uh, medic uh, medical uh, support uh, and uh, education. So there's various fronts on which the organization focuses on. So, for example, in Africa and in South America, we've got hospitals that are running that caters for, for uh, various uh, people that are perhaps not able to afford to do so. There's uh, projects that provide uh, water, um, uh, brings water to countries such as uh, countries in Africa where uh, water is scarce, scarce, so they're providing water wells through a program there. Um, and more so, and currently we have teams uh, across uh, uh, in Poland uh, uh, who, in particular who are supporting refugees uh, with the meals, etc., coming out from Ukraine. So very briefly, that's where the organization globally works. Um, I'm sure I've probably and you've some. mentioned about Ukraine as well, and obviously that's a, something that's very contemporary, and um, obviously a lot of support needed there. And that's like amazing to know how Humanity First is even involved there, irrespective of people's religion, faith, background, and stuff. We it's that like you know, completely yes, un absolutely. like unselfish, or just do that desire to just serve humanity, um, as we were mentioning absolutely. earlier in the program. But can you also just briefly touch on some of the things that we um, Humanity First is doing here in New Zealand as well. Yes, of course. So, uh, our, our last part of our program is around uh, providing support to families who are uh, perhaps in the lower socioeconomic environments uh, uh, generally, uh, and particularly in South Auckland and West Auckland, where we provide food parcels. So, at the moment, with, through support of other organizations, we are providing close to about 80 to 100 food parcels a week. Now, these contain food that will last the family up to a week and more so in terms of fresh fruit and veggies, uh, some dry stock, meat, uh, milk, 
uh, and sort of the very basics of uh, uh, families for a week. So, so we work with uh, a particular organisation that provides us with this, some of the goods, these goods. Plus, we do some fundraising as well to generate um, funds to then provide weekly food parcels. So, over the last sort of couple of years, and in particular since the uh, impact that COVID has had on families in New Zealand, particularly. Um, with uh, shortage of food, et cetera, or sort of limited uh, funds to support families, we've been providing these food parcels. And like I said, roughly about hundred odd dollars, uh, sorry, hundred uh, food packs a week that we do to families. And we work with local organizations also um, to who have wider networks to support them. So in particular in Auckland, Auckland City Mission, as well as other organization that we work with to uh, to provide that support. Um, and and uh, second to that, we've also provided relief for disaster uh, across the Pacific. So supporting relief efforts in Tonga when the tsunami hit there, as well as cyclones in Fiji. Uh, so we've uh, had uh, either food that's gone out there or funds that we've provided. And uh, similarly, we're working with uh, some local, uh, on a local project at the moment, we're at the, really at the infancy of a local project uh, in Tongariro, trying to set up a... Uh, uh, a water station and a solar station for uh, a group of uh, families that don't have access to water and electricity. So that's sort of a long-term project that we're uh, starting to undertake at the moment. That's that's incredible. I mean, some of the stuff that even I wasn't aware of, some of these um, projects that are being undertaken by Humanity First here in New Zealand as well. And obviously, with the increasing prices of um, all items and uh, inflation and stuff, I think um, more and more people need that um, support in the wider community as well. And part of our faith is, you know, service of humanity, um, and that's a very important aspect of our faith. So thank you for joining us, Jazakumullah, may Allah bless you. We've come to, the, we've, I think we've probably overrun our program today, but um, this was definitely worth having you online as well as a f first experience for us. Um, and we will hopefully, inshallah, um, invite you over again. But um, just having someone online has opened up the doors of much more opportunities for us. So Jazakullah for joining us. And inshallah, we will um, remain in touch. Jazakullah. And not a problem at all. More than a, pl a pleasure. Thank you so much well, for having us. As -salam as -salam. Okay, so there um, we've just explored another, opened another door of opportunities for us where we can have people join us online. So now I think um, we will be able to plan a lot better with the past few programs. We've been experiencing um, how to run this radio show now. And just uh, suddenly, that was just, you know, a sudden thought that came to us and you just phoned um, Brother Yunus just now and literally we got him on on the spot, no no preparation there, but it worked out well, I think. And hopefully that um, the viewers enjoyed that as well. And um, hopefully that opens up more doors for us to be able to do a lot more things, getting people for, uh, internationally to join us in this radio program um, and having those discussions as well. So inshallah that will um, work out very well. Well done. Jazakallah Muslim, sir. That's brilliant. Thank you. And um, so with that... I think we've probably run over um, a bit today, um, but uh, hopefully you all enjoyed the program. And um, inshallah, God willing, we will have um, a lot more new content now that we know um, of the possibilities. Yes. Um, so we hope you are able to join us. Please do, um, as Brother Tashik mentioned earlier as well, then please do give us a call on 0800 947526. Um, if you have any questions at all, um, just want to talk, just want to mention you you listen to us on the radio or on Wairapa TV, reach out to us. We want to know who, if you're actually listening, if this is um, of interest or just generally give us any any comments you have. Um, we'd be interested to know if you want to catch up over a cup of coffee. Um, let's, let's catch up. Um, let's meet up. So please do reach out to us 0800 947526. That's 0800 why Islam? 0800-947526. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Kia tau tirangi marie. May the peace and blessings of God Almighty be upon you all.